in the Banger Bar at Banger Films, where each week we debate, tear apart, and discuss our infamous heavy metal family tree, which we created for our first film, Metal a Headbanger's Journey, way back in 2004. We pick it apart one genre at a time. Before we get into this, we want to remind everyone to please subscribe to Banger TV and help us build a all-metal global digital channel and also to check us out at Apple Music because we, Banger, are now the official metal curators over there. This week, it's going to get fierce. We're going into black metal. Already, the debates have been fast and furious online and yeah, I have a feeling this one could get a little locked. To help me with this debate is none other than Jason DeVille, a prominent metal journalist and musician who works with Brave Words, which of course is Canada's biggest metal news site. But before I bring him on, he's adjusting his corpse paint and his spikes. Right now, we're going to jump to first of many clips. Here's a little piece from our film, Headbanger's Journey, where I head to the fjords and try to figure out what is black metal all about. Like thrash, black metal evolved from punk and the new wave of British heavy metal, with additional theatrical elements borrowed from shock rock. Its sound is raw, yet it is also epic and atmospheric, like punk rock meets Wagner dressed as Alice Cooper. Feels like a long time ago, boy, I was young, but it was exciting to go to Norway for the first time. Welcome, Jason. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank Thanks for, for joining me. us in the bar. This is a brave man from Brave Words, <laughs> one of the few willing to stick it out for the black metal debate. Tell me a bit about how you got into metal music. Well, it's been quite a journey. I'm in my early 40s now, and I think my first experience Introduction to metal was through my dad, actually, mm -hmm. um, and it was a Motorhead concert at eight years old. Right. Um, I recall coming out of that concert, a changed little guy, yep. and uh, from there, it's just been an onward and upward journey. Uh, my dad and I got Maiden tattoos together at the age of 16, and then, like any metalhead, progressed through the different uh, genres and the different eras, yep. and eventually, black metal came to be where it's at for me. And so. what specifically about black metal was appealing to you? I think coming from a death metal background, um, being in a band that was a death metal focused band with blackened elements, back in the early 90s when I was listening to bands like, I don't know, Testament, Candle Corpse, Deep mm -hmm. Side, mm -hmm. black metal started in the Norwegian side of black metal. Yep. And uh, something about it just spoke to me. Something inherent, something that the other bands weren't really tapping into yep. on an emotional level. Yep. Um, I can recall being at a Bush Bash, you know, listening to uh, whatever band it was on my headphones, wandering away in the middle of the night, yep. and just being at awe with the music and nature, and just looking up and, and thinking, this, this is the perfect soundtrack to... That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> You'll only hear Bush Bash here on a Canadian <laughs> talk show, but you're right, a lot of people I think gravitate towards black metal because of the feel and the atmosphere of the music rather than strictly the mechanics or the virtuosity of the music. Most importantly, this is all about you out in Chatland. We want to hear your opinions, your insights, and your arguments about black metal, what is black metal, what isn't black metal, and what bands should be added or deleted from the chart. Don't just tell us what bands you love. We don't like those comments. The comments we want are why you think a band should be added or a well-formed opinion about this music that we all love. Off camera, of course, we have the inimitable Lisa Latissour, who at times will ring this awful sound, which means we, normally I, have talked way too much. Okay, let's get into it. We spent a bit of time prior to uh, today talking about this thing. Now, a reminder, when we created this chart, there were two branches. One was called the first wave of black metal, and a second branch was simply called black metal. 
we've spent a bit of time since then talking especially about these early bands, Venom, Merciful Fate, Bathory, Hellhammer, Celtic Frost, that perhaps a better term for this is proto-black metal. Jason, I'd like to hear your thoughts on why we might call this proto-black metal. I, th I think because, you know, even though these bands are essential to where, where we ended up with black metal, mm. they aren't really black metal. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's something sonically yep. that's different yep. from what you and I know yep. today as black metal. Yep. Um, so I think, you know, adding the, the proto to it kind of puts it into its own category and kind of gives, you know, lends an air of uh, authenticity to what these guys were doing sure. prior to. Sure, and I think another critical piece here too is that these bands never really self-identified as being black exactly. metal. We have to remember that the term black metal came a little bit later. The term, of course, was on a Venom record back in 82, uh, but when it was used to actually refer to a genre, that didn't come until later. So we come prepared at proto. <laughs> the Banger Bar. We're putting Proto Black Metal up there. We'd like to hear what you have to say about this. And in many ways, although this is a rabbit hole, the same could be said for the foundations of heavy metal as a whole, because even <laughs> Sabbath and Zeppelin didn't really identify as being metal bands. But that is a discussion for another day. But Jason, um, Beyond what you've just told us in general, what's your feeling about this list of bands? Is this a is this a is this a good list of, of proto black metal bands? Do you think? I think it's a, a reasonable list. Yes, um, you know Venom obviously because of the term. Mm -hmm. um, I will throw in one little nugget here that mm -hmm. perhaps uh, isn't widely known, but two years prior to Venom actually coining the term black metal, there was a band out of Germany. Um, that actually had a demo called Black Metal Masters. And I think that was about 80, 81. Mm -hmm. um, and they went on to be a big kind of uh, entity in power metal are still existing today, but right. they did have elements in their first two demos of, um, of black metal. Very cool, um, yeah. So the other bands, obviously Merciful Fate, we can say, you know, King Diamond with the paint. Yep. But, you know, Hank Sherman, those guitar riffs, you know, they, they don't really resemble black metal at all. That's right. I think um, what we what's interesting about this is we're kind of seeing each band has kind of one or maybe two ingredients of what comes to be sort of undeniably black metal, as you're Definitely. saying. Certainly the aesthetic of Venom, the stage presentation of Merciful Fate. There's a kinship here though, I think in terms of definitely diving deeper into the darker uh, territory, right? This isn't thrash metal. No. These guys are dealing with some, uh, some topics, some diabolical <laughs> material. Um, so good. I think it's a solid foundation and I want to make sure we get a chance to send out our hails to the fans who are here from Arizona, Texas, Pennsylvania, the UK, Costa Rica, Germany, Wales, South Africa, Kenya, Portugal is back, Iceland, and most importantly, the man who spawned the bush basher, uh, Jason's dad, Wayne. Hello, Wayne. Thank you for joining. I hear you're a fan. Thank you very much. Okay, so we got some aesthetics. We got some lyrics. We kind of have a general understanding of what makes this proto uh, black metal. We're going to go to another clip, and this is from our episode Extreme Metal, where I traveled to Newcastle upon Tyne, which of course is home to much more than a football club and the police. Most importantly, it's the home to Venom. Here's Mantis. To what extent you felt like you were part of the new wave of British heavy metal, uh -huh. or you felt like you were something completely different? Um, I think, to be, to be perfectly honest, we didn't really feel that much of a part of it. Um, because to our eyes and to our mind, I think the, the new wave of British heavy metal was Iron Maiden, it was Def Leppard, it was Oh, Saxon and Samson and you know Vardis and all, all these bands and I've said this before and I think you know whether it was youthful arrogance or whatever we, we just didn't feel that we had any, anything in common with those particular bands again with, with this rock school thing I was doing I was doing a metal night and um, I just walked in and all the little guitarists were there and I heard a conversation between two of the little guys what kind of metal are you into what kind of metal are you into? Mm. It's like, you know, for me, 
we should just get back under that heavy metal flag, you know, and just all stand together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think it's become fragmented. So what a cool experience that was to hang in Newcastle with Mantis, whose mind is clearly swimming from the sub genrefication of metal. And uh, at the end of the day, he probably doesn't really care too much. But anyway, <laughs> let's see uh, what the people care about uh, with Venom. We've got Earthbound Lucifer weighing in. I still have my doubts for Venom. To me, they only coined the name and shared only a few elements with the later first wave of black metal but were otherwise proto-thrash metal or speed metal. What do you think, Jason? I, I agree with that. You know, I think, I think we can even add some punk in there. Um, Absolutely. Venom. Yeah. For sure. Um, you know, some of those 3-3 uh, those three, three beats or 4-4 four, four beats stuff that, uh, that punk bands were doing at the time. Yep. Venom kind of Definitely. just pulled it in, made it their own, and yep. added that satanic element right on top of it. Exactly. Busy time in music in the UK at that time. Punk was exploding, the early metal thing was starting to take off, so clearly they were grabbing from a lot of influences. Uh, Ivinder Gauti says the proto-black metal <clears throat> bands have elements, but are not black metal as we define it today. Venom needs to stay Ollie Ray, so I think Ivinder's kind of nailed why, we, why we've changed it to proto. I, however, I'm going to stand my ground. You must try to take me down. <laughs> Venom is going to stay. There would be no black metal if it wasn't for Venom next. Merciful Fate, metal punk rock and roll alt rock says, first wave is mainly non-black metal bands. Venom is mostly speed metal. Merciful Fate is classic metal, Celtic frost, thrash, avant-garde metal. Man, we need some new oh. branches <laughs> and some other metal genres. Bathory, I know they're probably the earliest band I've heard of playing black metal, but their stuff is thrash metal mixed with black metal. Wow, so thoughtful. Mm. Anything on there you want to pick up on, Jason? Well, any I thoughts? think, yeah, I think it wasn't until Bathory hit with, um, uh, the sign of the black mark yeah. that the third album that things really became black metal you right. know and they included that kind of viking uh, that whole ethos of viking that these guys picked up on yeah. um, being a swedish band um you know they, yeah. they definitely was within their realm to include those elements yeah. so bathory third album for sure we can call them i think the quintessential black metal at that right. point cool this is always difficult because as time passes our perspective changes right yeah. if we went back to the early 80s, this stuff is like off the map, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. But now, of course, stacked up against all of the, particularly the Norwegian bands, kind of tame. it's yeah. a kind of tame. So it depends on our perspective, depends on age, depends a lot of when we came into the music, all big factors. Okay, we've got some comments on Merciful Fate. Manute Drool, 91 is back. Merciful Fate should be off the list as they are more classic heavy metal than black metal. Hedge Knight. I think it's fair to keep Merciful Fate. The aesthetic and lyrical content are essential to forming black metal. Nick Oravano, Viano is back. Venom, Merciful Fate, Bathory, Hellhammer, and Celtic Frost, they all definitely need to stay. Thank you, Nick. While they might not be considered black metal by today's standards, they are all pivotal in caps to establishing the genre's beginning sonically, visually, lyrically, everything. Where would black metal be if it wasn't for King Diamond's vocal style, Celtic Frost instrumentation, or Kronos's lyrics. Thank you, Nick. Did you do the chart? Good job, buddy. I would agree on all fronts. I think we're going to give this a little more time before we start to think about moving uh, bands around. I agree. Maybe what's missing here is a little definition, uh, some characteristics of what uh, defines black metal. In your opinion, what are some of the, the important ingredients? Important ingredients. Well, I guess this black and white aesthetic right here. That's Definitely right. <laughs> for those of us that uh, you know grew up with this stuff, mm -hmm. for certain. Um, other than that, it's obviously the screeching vocals. Yep. Um, you know that lo-fi kind of buzzsaw guitar. Yep. Um, in the case of bands like Dark Throne or even Mayhem, some of the earlier stuff, you know, kind of a, a base like a rock and roll almost kind of mid-paced element to some of the stuff, you yep. know, and yep. it gets a, kind of a creepy vibe. For sure. Um, bands like Satyricon, a little later, Emperor, you know, adding that a little more um, um, orchestric vibe to it. Yeah. But for the early stuff, I think we're going to go with lo-fi. Yeah. We're going to go with screeching vocals. Yeah. Um, and, you know, very just kind of 
earthy, rootsy type stuff. Definitely, and I think, you know, we also talked uh, briefly about lyrical matter. Obviously, we're dealing with um, satanic or uh, delving into that much more darker end of the spectrum, some occult uh, and drawing on, on some, some volcanic imagery yeah. in the case of uh, Dimu Borgir. Interestingly, too, we get this thing called the blast beat, which had really not been sort of used heavily, uh, right. where almost uh, you get this sense of atmosphere of almost floating in the music rather than this sort of steady meter that had been a characteristic of the new wave of British heavy metal or, or thrash metal. So, yep. and that, that's sort of that atmosphere you talked about, about being out in nature. I think that's a big part of it for fans. Definitely right? yep. the blast beat totally added to that, you yep. know. Um, yep. In fact, I spoke to Ishan just yesterday of the Mighty Emperor and we had about an hour long chat and I mentioned to him that I was coming to, uh, to speak with you yeah. today and he sends his regards, by the way. Hello, Ishan. Um, Ishan has an album dropping next week, yep. I believe next Friday. Yep. And I asked him what was his thought, what did he think black metal was? This, mm -hmm. like, from back then to now, like, mm -hmm. where has it gone? What does it mean to him? And I have a quote, if you don't mind me Please. reading Please, I love a man that comes prepared <laughs> with a script. I need one of those. We're including Ishan. What in does our Ishan discussion. have to say? Please go ahead. So he said, "Black metal is not a type of guitar sound, nor is it how fast you can play or how screechy your vocals are. Black metal, first and foremost, is an attitude, an atmosphere. There is an inherent fragility to this music, born of a very individualistic and free thought type of philosophy. There is no blueprint of what black metal is. Black metal is a feeling." And I thought it was really cool that he said there was a fragility to it. Right. And I thought about that a little more, and we talked about it a little more. And there is, you know, as, yeah. as sonically insane as it can be, there's always that kind of fragile, yep. um, like it could fall apart at any moment. That's right. You know? It's a soundtrack to the most brutal blizzard you could possibly you imagine. <laughs> but I agree, that sense of atmosphere, I think, is very important uh, in this music. When people talk about death metal, or thrash metal, or the other genres within the extreme metal, atmosphere or feeling is not a word that people use to describe. So I think you're absolutely right. Thank you, Ishan, for bringing that up. This man, Fenris, has always loved this concept of primitive, of being a hallmark of black metal. Let's listen to Fenris. It had a primitive feel. Well, uh, first of all, we were tired of playing technical um, and uh, our bassist wanted to take it even further and he now plays jazz and it was clear he was going in that direction and uh, we, we were tired of the way thrash metal had toned down, became more straight, death metal on the other hand became more technical with us as well. Uh, but we wanted to just nip that in the bud. In terms of the Norwegian scene, um, was this black metal as, at its inception, this idea of it being primitive? Uh, or what it should be, in your, in your, in your opinion? Yeah, we, th we think it should be uh, mostly primitive. We don't think that the, the, the flag carriers for that style uh, should have to be uh, intricate or uh, listen mama I can really play and I got a scary face paint as well I mean we could do it as simple as kiss no no problem mm. just make it uh, just different and colder mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah that's what I believe <laughs> their primitive, which kind of ties into the atmospheric conversation we were just having, that I think for a lot of people, this feeling of it being primitive, stripped down, is very important. I mean, we got away from it a bit here, and mm -hmm. we're kind of coming back to it again, which I'm sure we'll get into, but thank you, Fenris, never short on words. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, when we bring our guests in, we always like to open up the conversation and uh, talk about some bands that might be missing. And Jason, you feel there's one band that needs to be up here. Yeah, I think uh, Sarcophago mm -hmm. um, from Brazil. Yep. They released an album in 87 called Inri. Um, and actually, their singer uh, was the uh, original vocalist of Sepultura. Um, so what, what they kind of brought to the table and what Fenris has said in the past is that uh, the corpse paint, the image 
um, was first and foremost for a lot of these Norwegian bands. Yeah. Um, they picked up on that and then a few short years later, you know, started kind of copying that and making it their own. So I think sar sarcophagal, for that reason alone and musically, um, should be included. Now, on the are list. they proto or black metal proper? You know, it was 87. Uh -huh. It was, here's the difficult thing Mayhem had already released Pure Fucking Armageddon. Right. And then they had released the Death Crush EP. So these two had released stuff right around the same time. Right, right. So I think maybe somewhere. In Somewhere between. in between, or maybe black metal proper. I, yeah, mean, I, yeah. I, I mean, I would agree. It's funny, I flash back, I did a radio show called Overkill uh, in my late teens, and I remember playing Sarcophago on the show, and it was like something super primitive. I just remember it having this feeling like, what is going on? And, and I, you know, it was a time when everyone thought that the only thing coming out of Brazil was Sepultura, but clearly yeah. there's an important band. Okay, what do people have to say about Sarcophago? Gaura Patero, Espana is back. Sarcophago, fuck yeah. I-N-R-I. Max Morin, I think Sarcophago from Brazil deserves a spot. They invented corpse paint. Hedge Knight, Sarcophago's sound was highly important because it's similar to Mayhem's Death Crush EP. They are needed for Proto. Okay, there's an argument for Proto <laughs> there. We'll see how this goes. Francois Genest uh, says Sarcophago was probably the most influential outside of Europe and North America. I don't think we would disagree with you there, no. Francois. And Krzysztof Muller Olsen, Sargophago, and the Belo Horizonte scene was a small part of what inspired the Norwegian scene. Vaughn was a huge influence. So, you got some friends out there. Sargophago is there, they're here to stay. Fucking great logo. The best logos on the whole chart, but that's all. Oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a discussion <laughs> for another time. Okay, so what's next, Lisa? Are we going to the boards? What do people have to say out there? Well, there's a lot of things we forgot, so let's start. Um, Please start getting into some of these other proto metal suggestions we've okay. got here. Okay, you got it. Sodom is an interesting uh, band, obviously out of Germany. Of kind of often treaded that line or stand on either line of the, the thrash and maybe even death and, and, and black metal genres. Greg Baltzer, first wave is correct, except that it should include early Sodom. Sodom's first LP and EP were hugely influential in the development of modern black metal. Euronymous, founder of Norwegian black metal, even named his record label after Sodom's song, Death Like Silence. Thank you, Greg. Ben O'Malley, I second Sodom for proto-black metal. Obsessed by cruelty and love. That early Sodom stuff is an essential metal album. What do you think about Sodom? Where do they belong? I would argue that, that they belong in proto. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Um, I think there's quite a few other bands out there that aren't quite as known as Sodom. Yeah. That deserve that spot. Right. Um, Sodom, to me, has always been... I grew up with Sodom. Yeah. I never considered them black metal. I never considered them forefathers of black metal. Right. Thrash. It's thrash, man. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, creator, even earlier creator, um, maybe a little more black metal inspired than even Sodom. Yeah. But one band I think should be on there that might replace Sodom or some of the arguments for Sodom yeah. is Tormentor. And Tormentor right. existed around the same time. Right. And featured, obviously, the... Um, uh, later to be the vocalist of Mayhem, Attila. Right. And, um, right. you know, they had an album in 87, right. some early demos that were definitely far more black metal than anything some of these suggested black metal bands Interesting. were Interesting. So anybody out there have some opinions on Tormentor? I want to hear about them. Let's see. There's a few more Sodom comments here. Rich at the Metal Asylum, Sodom only did two albums that were black metal. Okay, you could probably make an argument that there's other bands that have that. But anyway, Sam Falloon, Fallon, pardon me, Sodom is way too thrashy. Same with Creator and Destruction. War War, Sodom is a must in proto. And Philip Alvarez, Sodom is essential proto black metal. I knew this would get locked up <laughs> this episode. I didn't think it was going to go that far for Sodom. Yeah, I, wow. I um, personally... I've always seen Sodom as more of a, of a thrash band. Um, you know, the, the unholy trinity of German thrash, Destruction, Crater, and Sodom. Yes. Definitely Sodom had that dirtier, more primitive sound to them. But, you know, if I think about, like, the aesthetics, there's a certain aesthetic harmony that runs through all of this. And I still feel that Sodom's in kind of like that death, 
thrash yeah, they were doing, zone. They were doing more like war type themes at the time, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there are some, some arguments that can be made for, uh, you know, war metal, which verged on black metal, kind of the two kind of combined. Yep. Um, bands like Impaled Nazarene, um, bands like Blasphemy out mm -hmm. of Vancouver, out of BC. Yeah. Um, they were doing that war metal type thing. Yep. Sodom might fit a little better into that type of category. That's a good point. Yeah, um, I think we, to lay some groundwork, I mean, I think aesthetic, lyrics, uh, and that sense of atmosphere is really important here. And I think, I think we're going to so. hold off on Sodom just a bit longer. But I see there's some Tormentor comments coming in. War War, nothing against Tormentor, but I think Master's Hammer were more important. Spear788 uh, says that Tormentor deserves their credit, but Master's Hammer should not be overlooked. Luca, Hope, Fallon, you got to put Master's Hammer on early along with Tormentor and Blasphemy, some love for the West Coast. Ritual is an incredible album as is, I can't even pronounce this, Jilimniki Akolstista, <laughs> and it'll be good to get a little more non-Scandinavian bands on the, on the black metal chart. Lisa, do I pull out a Sharpie? Can I pull out a Sharpie and add some bands here? For Master's Hammer, are you, are you committed? I, uh, well, I think maybe hold off on t Tormentor because I don't know if there's quite enough love out there for those guys, but we're gonna add Master's Hammer, and uh, you know, if uh, Jason just gave me a semi nasty look there, so. Maybe. Well, admittedly, I don't know a lot about Master's Hammer, so you know, but we'll trust these guys, right? We're, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're gonna try and stay friends. We're all gonna try and stay yeah. friends. Anyway, uh, Nicholas Glover, cool. Nicholas Glover says that Ragnarok should be on here. They have been at it since the establishment of black metal. Ragnarok have been the most consistent black metal band throughout their career. Thoughts? I agree. I agree yep. that Ragnarok have been insanely consistent, but they've kind of fallen down yeah. here. Right. I mean, down here. Right. To some of these other bands, the status of some of these other bands. It's that true. doesn't mean to say that what they're doing is not relevant. Yeah. It's just, um, you know, they just kind of... Fall out of the radar a little it's bit. It's true. I, I think we'll hold off on Ragnarok. I want to see if there's any more uh, love in the audience for Black Metal Love. Uh, that is for uh, that band. Lisa, are we ready to move on to something salacious? Well, if we don't stop talking about Burzum, like uh -huh. I'm worried about how much wood and oh, flammables there are in the building. Okay. But I think that Jason had a bone to pick uh, uh -oh. that we were going to try and, and give him yeah. five seconds to do. Pick the bone. Mayhem. Um, we touched on it earlier when we brought up Sarcophago. Mayhem released um, that pure fucking Armageddon yep. um, demo back yep. in 86 yep. and then followed up with the Death, Death Crush EP. It's not too far removed from what some of these guys were doing and this guy. I mean, if we're going to throw Master's Hammer in there, I think Mayhem... Mm. I don't know if they're... Obviously, they're not proto, yeah. so... You know, moving these guys over to Proto it doesn't make any sense because what came next was based off well, what these were doing. Maybe we can be somewhat Swiss in our approach, and maybe there's a bridge here. I think if there's I can a bridge. Get it off the board. There's yeah. a sarcophago mayhem kind of transitionary sound that that's is brilliant. going on here. That uh, these are the guys that are that are that are connecting the dots. That's a tough one for me. I think I've always seen Mayhem as a sort of quintessential early black metal, obviously Norwegian black metal, kind of in tandem with Dark Throne. Uh, though you are right, like the early Mayhem stuff was actually far more death metal, and it took them that time to kind of go towards um, where bands like Dark Throne. Yeah. Were. Yep. So I can see the merits in that. Um, I just struggle with moving them because the length of the career, their f the level of flag waving for black metal that Nick Necro Butcher somewhat famously berated me for in Headbangers Journey. I think Journey. he's scared if he moves him, he's going to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> Necro and I have made up. I think we're okay. Let's put them there. Let's see if people agree. Maybe we need the sorta proto, the quasi proto. I don't know. Too many words. <laughs> Burzum, Liam yeah. Gordon says that put Burzum where mayhem was. Burzum showed that there was more emotion to black metal. Good point. Horror Master says Burzum has to be in the chart. If you have mayhem in the chart, you must put them up. Uh, Charles Cortijos says where's Burzum. Uh, Gigi <laughs> Vigernis, 
uh, Varg, if you've joined us, uh, we'd be flattered. Add Burzum, since because of Burzum, ambient elements were popularized. Good point. And GRP simply puts, where the fuck is Burzum? I think there's a good point there. I think I there's think so. some definite... Uh, we've got a unanimous... That's not going to go very far. <laughs> a highlighter is that Burzum uh, needs to be... Added. I think as we touched on earlier and what Ishan was mentioning, that fragility in black metal, I think Burzum were the first to bring that, you yeah. know, that, that, uh, that anguish in the vocals that yep. was later picked, on, picked up um, in depressive black metal, some of the sub-sub-genres the, uh, that have come later. So Absolutely. Burzum, I think, deserves a spot just for that alone. You're right. And I mean, obviously, controversy surrounding Varg aside, you're absolutely right. We're seeing kind of the... Uh, yet another wave of black metal now, which of course has expanded globally. A lot of American black metal bands uh, coming out of places like Brooklyn, of all yeah. places, mm -hmm. who are really kind of tapping into that uh, that atmospheric, uh, emotional, sort of uh, natural uh, sound, if you will. Yep. T-Bone5455 five, five, five says, quite simply, where's Immortal? And Artur F. Kastanha chimes in. What about Immortal? They deserve to be on that list. Sons of Northern Darkness and Battles in the North are essential black metal albums. When I realized that Bl Immortal wasn't on this list, I nearly quit my job. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. Sons of Northern Darkness remains one of the all-time greatest extreme metal albums. So absolutely Immortal is on there. And of course, Abbott is back with a self-titled project. You don't want to get me started on these guys. I'm a huge fan. Uh, what are your thoughts on Immortal? Definitely. Yeah. They, uh, they need to be there. Um, when we talk about consistency, yeah. this is a band. For Consistent, sure. You and know? they always had a bit more of, I mean, they, this, these are acres apart in terms of sound, oh, but yeah. much more of a, a percussive, rhythmic, death metal approach. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you can crab walk across an entire festival stage while playing black metal, you're on my list. Josh Hunt agrees, fucking Immortal, pure full moon mysticism, and Evinder Gauti, what? Not the old logo of Immortal. Next time, next time, we'll have the old logo. We promise. I think one thing about Immortal as well is they were the first to kind of bring, um, you know, musicality to black metal. There yeah. was a lot of uh, harmonies and a little, a little better production than some of what the, the earlier bands were doing. That's bands that Demu picked up on, and so Immortal yeah. for that reason, yeah. Yeah, Abbott kind of brought a very distinctive guitar sound where it was sort of like back in the mix but filling the whole spectrum. Very full, right? too. Rather yeah. than, you know, typically metal, the guitar is right there. Yes. Um, yeah. I thought that was a really cool um, direction for Abbott to take metal. Lisa! So I can't put up the immortal comments because they are A, too many, uh -huh. and B, just say immortal in all caps, like there's nothing else to be said. There isn't. Next. There is nothing else to be said about immortal. They, they rule. Um, what about Cradle of Filth? I think there's a bit more to be said about that. Is there time to dig into Cradle of Filth? Uh, Probably no band in the history of making films about metal, uh, speaking personally, has, uh, has generated as much debate as this band. Uh, here we go. We're going to throw to a clip of Cradle of Filth to get us in. Check it out. Maybe that's a good place to start. Um, do you consider Cradle of Filth a black metal band? Well, a lot of people wouldn't. I mean, we were there at its... Uh... At the, at the birth of like the second wave, we I mean, were right in the thick of it with, you know, bands like Immortal and Dark Throne and Emperor. At that point, we were considered. And then we weren't considered when we got popular. And then we were reconsidered when uh, it was kind of died off a bit. So yeah. I'm not really, I'm not the best person to ask really, because I never know from one minute to the next what we're supposed to be. I guess it was because we went straight away for uh, sort of quite lavish, what we thought at the time, production, which uh, sounds a bit barbarian when you listen to it, but at the time it was kind of lavish. And I think it was the fact that we were the only band doing it and we were separated by a tractor water. Yeah. 
go to the North Sea. But what, if anything, do you think <clears throat> does make Cradle of Filth black metal? Well, this is the thing. I think it's because we we stood the test of time. I mean, a lot of people have bitched about us, which I don't actually give a shit. You know, I've got not enough time on my hands to worry about the things I need to worry about, yeah. let alone, you know, kids in their bedrooms. Um, but I think it's the fact that we've been we've been there since its inception. The second wave's inception, yeah, right. and you know it's 20 years on now, yeah, yeah. and I think because of that, we kind of, I'm sure, earned the right. So we got a tricky one there. Uh, we got a we got a black metal band that doesn't self-identify as being black metal. And let me be clear for all of you that lambasted us for putting them on the Norwegian black metal chart. Originally, we know they're from the UK. But my rationale has always been, where else are we going to put Cradle of Filth? Let's see what the board has to say. JL Troxel 278, can we remove Cradle yet? Justin Fogarty, no Cradle of Filth. Nestor Gonzalez, Cradle equals extreme gothic metal. The tree grows. Josh Hunt says, uh, no Cradle of Filth, for God's and Satan's sake. How, uh, how wise of you, sir. Uh, Badulism, the core, the corpse paint, the atmosphere, the darkness. Yes, Cradle of Filth is black metal. It goes on and on. Corey Che McGillagot says that Cradle of Filth was part of that scene of the second wave of bands, whether anyone likes to admit it or not. And lastly, Nick at Night 666 says that as much as elitists tend to want to hate filth, we leave, maybe we are. Principle of Evil <laughs> was the beginning of the goth-themed expansion and depressiveness of the next waves, theatrical and evil, exclamation mark. Weigh in. Help me out here. What well, are your thoughts? I don't want to argue with Nick at night. I know that guy. Uh-oh. And he's a huge Cradle yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, he makes a point. I just, I think, you know, Principle of Evil made flesh. Obviously, we can consider that one a classic black metal album. All the elements are there. Yeah. The music's there. The imagery. It's just where did they end up? Where are they now? You yeah. know, and yeah. I think you had a good point. We were speaking off camera mm -hmm. um, about maybe where we could we could put Cradle. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what's happened since obviously the huge influence of Dimu and Cradle. I mean, let's not deny it. These are two bands that have had an enormous influence yeah. on metal music. Perhaps we should have a new branch called Symphonic Black Metal because obviously since. Uh, these bands have made that impact. We've seen many other bands. Yes, Lisa. That is such an excellent idea that everyone has already suggested it. Okay, well, delicious dishes. <laughs> Cradle can stay. Let the true cult crowd cry all they want. Brian Begay, if you put Cradle on, then put Kiss on Proto. <laughs> hmm. That's an interesting point. Uh, Kiss is like in eight different parts on the chart. It's very problematic. Guts, Dozer, Cradle, and Dimu should go into symphonic black metal with Emperor and Limbonic Art. That's uh, interesting. Emperor, I don't Krizistof know. Mular Olsen is back. Cradle were the pioneers of symphonic black metal. They were signed before Dimu Borgir, and so many bands tried to be Cradle in the 90s. You can hate them all they want, but they belong. We're not denying they don't belong on this chart. Cradle is an enormously influential band. The question I think that we're raising is, and maybe we'll just do this for argument's sake, if we put Dimu and Cradle lower down and pretend we have symphonic black metal, I want to hear some other bands that need to be uh, filled in there. No. Wouldn't agree. With, we'll be here all night. Wouldn't agree. Uh, on Emperor. No. I think Emperor belongs. I think you agree. I, I do, too. Yeah. I, I think Emperor obviously had some symphonic elements, but they weren't they weren't the showcase of the music like yeah. these two bands, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, agree. I mean, early Emperor is so genre-defining, in, yes. in, in, in my opinion. So here's the task. This is the problem, people. You pull someone off and put them where they're going to go. So if we if we need a symphonic black metal branch, then let's make it into a branch. Two bands don't make a branch. What do we got here? Nicholas Glover put Cradle of Filth on Gothic Metal. Interesting point. Thrash Maniac 99, Cradle of Filth should be on Gothic Metal. Hmm, some strong opinions. Shock Rock is an interesting um, thought too, because that of course is a genre that goes everything from, you know, Alice Cooper to Rammstein. It's right. just about, you know, the purpose of your music rather than the sound or the look. So maybe there's something. something I think there. nowadays Cradle fits that for sure. Yeah. You know? Okay. Um, okay. So Cradle of Filth, 
Shock Rock, let us know. Another matter altogether, of course, is Dimu. Guts Dozer. Dimu is Symphonic Black, which should be a separate branch. Okay, we're getting some consensus. Ivan Tom Lenovich, sorry for the pronunciation, Tompa. It's not the Tompa from At the Gates. If it is, hello, sir. <laughs> Dimu Borgir. Live kills all of them except the true mayhem and David Schneer Hart uh, for all tid and Stormblast. I agree. After that, they became a parody of themselves, in my opinion, spit in the face of the aesthetic of black metal by becoming an overly commercial product, which isn't what black metal represents. Just my opinion, though. Wow. Tell us how you really feel. Um, tricky. This is tricky territory. It is very tricky. Um, um, I mean, it, 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 this is the problem with black metal because I think that if we're dealing with a genre that initially is, is an aesthetic at the core, it kind of lets the music go wherever it wants to. And, you know, yeah. this and this could not be further apart, Dark That's Throne true. and Cradle. If we were to go back to what Ishan said and, you know, there's no blueprint for black metal, then we can consider all of this black metal, yeah. you know, at, at the heart. But, but there's hard. a sentiment, of course, uh, with everyone that there is a certain, that this commitment to being primitive and this commitment yes. to lo-fi, which of course these bands just, they just blew it out of the water. Exactly. And these, these two bands, especially for me, this band is a leader. You know, yeah. what they were doing has been copied by many bands, not nearly as good. And uh, yeah. Tricky. Yeah. So we stand our ground. If there's other symphonic black metal bands, let us know. Otherwise... They're going back in. Ben O'Malley, yes. So I just think that as we're uh, getting close to that time uh, yes. of wrapping up, that this is exactly where the discussion is going for the future black metal episodes, which is what are the other branches that we need to make? Yeah, so good point. Not only do we want to hear uh, more symphonic black metal bands, we will have a show dedicated to that. What are the other yep. um, places that we need to take this? Oh, that's a good point. I think we're dealing with a subgenre that has become enormously complex, yes. even just in the 12 years since we first made the tree. So I think this is part one of a bigger <laughs> discussion, but let's see what the board is saying. I think we've got more agreement from Ben O'Malley that Emperor were symphonic black metal from the beginning, interesting. Andy Bass, black metal needs more charts. Need to find a place for Agaloc, uh, Winter Filleth, Ghost Bath, UADA, et cetera. Black metal is now spanning different styles beyond what is classically regarded as black metal. I'll just chuck in Campfar and Gehenna for some older bands that are still putting out uh, good music. I think at last count, when I was doing some research for this, the, the newer black metal sub-subgenres, I think I reached 13. Right. 13. So yeah. that's, a, that's a task for you and your... Uh... It is. <laughs> yeah. It is. And I think our approach to this has always been... Um, we make films, not magazines, and so we want to make sure that these bands and styles have actually made an imprint on the evolution of the music, yes. that it's not just a list of the newest, hottest bands, because obviously that would be, uh, the room is not big enough yeah. for that. Um, so we just want to be sure that some of these bands that are being mentioned um, are uh, making a clear mark right. on the music. Derek Jolly, maybe add a melodic black metal branch and add Dissection, Sacramentum, Thalcandra, Unet, I don't know how to pronounce this, Unan Animated, Dawn, and Nagelfar. Good point. John Van Dyke, should we consider Satyricon for symphonic black metal? I think there's a case. Mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of like a bit of a bridge, similar, less so emperor in my opinion, of this sort of more theatrical, bombastic, yeah. epic. Uh, maybe right in here. Maybe right down the, if we're yeah. building another bridge <laughs> yeah. uh, through troubled waters. Uh, what else we got? Manut Rule, Man Rule is back, 91. Black and death metal and unblack metal and unblack metal. It's like no path, unblack metal. I don't understand that. Anderson Smith, atmospheric black metal, Ollie Ray, black gaze. A lot of people want to talk about Deaf Haven. And Deaf Haven. Yeah. I feel another episode coming on, people. Lisa, what do you say? Any there's, more bands to add? There's a couple that are just making a run for it at the last minute. Maybe we give some shout outs and consideration mm -hmm. here. It's true. We have, we've been pretty conservative. 
I've seen a lot of only one band added. Yes, go a lot ahead, of Jason. Chatter for Sam I. and Rotting Christ. Okay. Early stuff. Yeah, um, and Ben O'Malley also wears Uber. Good point. They were one of the most innovative black metal bands of the '90s, along with Ved Buen's Ende, Monkey 360. Yes, Oliver for sure. Lucas Cesar, Early Sam Ale, and Rotting Christ. I think Uber deserves to be on there. I think that was an oversight. What do you think? Before I add a magnet. I think so. I think they had one of the quintessential lo-fi black metal albums ever that yes. sounded like it was recorded on a boombox. Yep. Um, but, you know, a couple albums after that, they went into trip-hop territory. It's tricky. Yeah, it's, it's very tricky. tricky. But those first, yeah. like Bergtat and the album before that, uh, Natron's Madrigal, they're both, I think, quintessential Norwegian black metal albums. Very balanced perspective. I just want to write some magnets, man, because we don't have enough up there. <laughs> well, I want to hear why, because a lot of people are just telling us, Rod and Christ need to be up there. Yeah. But we don't, like, tell us why you think Good that. Good point. The Earthbound Lucifer, don't forget Sabbath from Japan, and Bulldozer from Italy. We're sort of getting some Watain is in here. We're seeing Death Haven, Rod and Christ, Rod and Christ. What are your thoughts on Rotting Christ? I think we've given a lot of attention to Norway. And yeah. I think Greece, you know, other than Sarcophago, um, you know, they were one of the early bands yep. um, prior to some of these bands releasing, uh, you know, Black Metal yep. albums. So yep. I think they do deserve a place yep. um, somewhere in here. Yeah. We're going to spread the geographical love and put Greece on the map. With and Rotting Christ. Still relevant today. Still going right. strong. I mean, yeah. I think that's I'm at maybe a bit premature with over. I got a little anxious <laughs> there. Uh, I think your point is right because that's another factor we always have to consider is the longevity, whether they've strayed from the sound. Bands change over time, yeah. right? And uh, can't fault them for it, but it makes our job Fucking difficult. Uh, neurotic goth guy, Rotting Christ, founded the Greek Wave and have been doing it forever. Okay, we're getting some support there. The Earthbound Lucifer, don't forget Sabbath from Japan and Bulldozer from Italy. Do we have that twice or maybe I read it twice? Nestor Gonzalez, Samuel Thorns, Impaled Nazarene. One thing about Thorns I want to mention. Please. Is, um, uh, Thorns, uh, Snorri Rook, yep. who's the, the creator of Thorns, um, early on him and Euronymous can be credited as creating the Norwegian black metal sound. Yeah. Um, basically, that was on guitar. It was the first time those two, um, when they got together, that the open kind of string approach yep. to black metal yep. um, was introduced. Right. And right. Uh, it later went on to inform bands like Satyricon and Emperor. Right. Um, I think Snorre of Thorns doesn't get the, the credit he deserves. That said, he went to jail for a long time. Yeah. And when was he out came of the game? Up, yeah, was out yeah. of the game for yeah. a while. But yeah. Um, definitely Sounds like be. you'd rather Thorns up there than Uber. Maybe a Thorns Uber <laughs> split, you know? <laughs> They'll do a, a split EP together. Yeah. <laughs> Julius, how about some early Finnish black metal bands like Beherit, Behexen, etc., or even Sodom from Germany? We've disposed with the Sodom debate. We're not adding them. I am sorry, Julius. But I think we've kind of got to the point, Lisa, where it's just becoming a bit of a list. <laughs> it is. Right? Yeah, it Our well-articulated, well-formed arguments. Yeah, I mean, don't worry. Away. We're going to get to Behemoth. We're going to get to Death Heaven. <laughs> like, it's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I think what we learned today is we're not done. Jason, thank you for joining me in the thank Banger Bar. That was awesome. Thanks for all your help. Daniel, Lisa, and Andrew, thank you for making this happen Few reminders. First, subscribe please to Banger TV. We want to build this into a full metal channel. Go over to uh, Apple Music where this guy has helped put together a playlist for us uh, for black metal. Also, we got some other reminders in here. There's a cool documentary called Black Hearts. Cool, debatable, there's some chat going on. Check it out on Banger TV. We know these guys over in Norway. They've been working hard on this. Go check it out and tell us what you think. Lockhorns returns next week for Grindcore. Am I right? Mm. We are still planning to do our panel discussion on the issue of race and racism in metal, which is very important. We're going to get to that. But next week, Grindcore. Here we go. Carcass, Bolt Thrower, Napalm Death. Take off your gloves, people, and we'll pick <laughs> up black metal in the future. Thank you. Goodbye.